Hi, my name is John Downing. I'm a limnologist and aquatic ecologist, and this is session 19 in a course uh, in aquatic ecology and limnology. And the topic of this session is macrophyte and littoral zone ecology. Now, session 18 looked at sort of the evolution and development and biodiversity of aquatic macrophytes, and the next session is going to be talking about wetlands and wetland types. And um, we've been sort of developing a theme here talking about various kinds of biological organisms within uh, aquatic ecosystems. And we're spending three sessions at least on uh, sort of these uh, rooted plants and shallow waters and so on. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, and, um, and we'll touch on those in just a minute. But um, there may be some things you already know about macrophytes and littoral zones in aquatic ecosystems. And uh, if you've been around lakes and ponds, you know that big plants, or what you may call weeds, and I'd encourage you not to, are sometimes found in the shallow water. They can be really quite thick and abundant, and, or they can be very sparse, and they have different abundances in different kinds of environments. You may have already observed things like that. Um, generally, people don't like to swim with a lot of uh, aquatic plants around them, and um, and so are quite annoyed by them. But I'm going to try to encourage you to think in a different way. Um, now, if you fish at all, um, you some and you fish in lakes or ponds. Sometimes you fish by casting into weed beds from the open water, and sometimes you troll along the edge of the weed beds. And this should tell you something about where fish live and why these aquatic systems are really important, why the littoral zones and macrophytes are pretty important. Um, and if you've watched these um, systems with any uh, care at all, you probably notice that sometimes, especially toward the end of summer, if you're in the temperate zone, um, you'll see flowers come up above the surface of the, uh, of the water. And uh, this should give you some hints about what kinds of plants those are. The flower and uh, probably seed as well, um, you know, the release, uh, they, they reproduce just like any other flowering plant. Some of them do and some of them don't. And that's kind of what we were talking about in the last session. Um, n another thing you might have observed is that some water plants have leaves that are totally in the air. Uh, and maybe the roots in the water. Some have their leaves at the surface or on the surface, and some have their leaves underwater. And, and those are three very important different types of aquatic macrophytes that we'll talk about. And another thing that you might have observed is that, um, especially if you've done much exploring, is that plants growing around the edges of water bodies are sometimes so big and dense you can't get through them. Um, so they can grow in quite um, high proliferation. and also, if you've been diving um, or snorkeling down in weed beds, you've noticed that they can become very, very dense, and their productivity is quite important. And again, we touched on that really briefly in the last session, too. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about why I'm really interested in um, the littoral zone. And um, one of them is, uh, when I was a, a student just coming into limnology, I actually um, was very interested in the functioning of um, of lakes and ponds, and uh, decided I needed to go off and study marine uh, marine biology and ecology. And as I was doing that, I found that in marine systems, the littoral zones and shallow zones are revered and studied at great intensity, with a large body of theory concerning the littoral zone, um, because they're very productive and important, especially in sort of fisheries and well, other things that you may be familiar with, like corals and, and shellfish and a variety of things like that. Littoral zones are very important. So when I was studying marine biology, I contrasted that with limnology, and I found limnology to be somewhat wanting, is that um, whereas marine ecologists study often the benthic environment and the, um, and the littoral zone in particular, um, and had developed even in the 1950s a great deal not, that's when I was not when I was studying it. Obviously, much more recently than that. Um, uh, but you know, they are um, studying a great deal in the littoral zone, even very early on in the development of marine biology and oceanography. Whereas uh, limnologists, when I looked at that literature, I found that a limnologist hardly ever studied the littoral zone. It was highly inconvenient to work in limnologists. Um, in uh, when I began to study. Either, and even now, this is, um, these are data from 20, 2005 to 2015 taken from the Web of Science on the percent of the number of publications in limnology that are 
centered on any of these zones. And what you'll notice here is that about 40% of these publications are um, oriented toward the uh, pelagic zone, a little bit less benthic, and very much less a littoral zone. Littoral zones studied almost half as much as either the pelagic or the benthic zone um, by uh, limnologists or those are, or aquatic ecologists. And, um, and, and yet, you'll see later on here um, in this session that littoral zone is probably the most productive area of any aquatic system. If there is any of it, it's probably very productive. It's probably very biodiverse and very central to the functioning of that system. And I think that's a historical artifact that comes from the ease of study of various systems. I think limnologists like to think of lakes as kind of ecosystem soup that they could sample with a bottle. Um, and yet, the highly inconvenient littoral zone is extremely busy and lots going on there. And even from your own experience, if you've been fishing or swimming or snorkeling in aquatic systems, you already know there's a lot of life there. And then when I became a certified scuba diver at age nine, which in those days I think they were trying to kill off children by, by allowing me to do that, but um, I, um, as soon as I got down below about 10 meters in the systems that I was working on, there was very little life at all. And, um, and so much of the life in aquatic systems is in the shallow water, and yet very little of the study is in shallow water. And I, part of my career has been oriented toward correcting that. And that's part of the reason that I spend a substantial amount of time talking about littoral zone and littoral zone ecology. And that's what we'll be talking about today. So um, what I have objectives for this session, not, um, rather than just uh, discussing it randomly. I'd like you to learn about the literal, uh, literal zone primary production and the factors limiting it. And what you're going to learn in this is that the littoral zones of the world, and that includes things like wetlands and coastal zones, are the most productive environments on the planet. Okay, So that's one thing I'd like you to learn about. I'd like you to understand the types of primary producers found in the littoral zone, and we'll sort of walk our way through those a little bit, although we've already talked about that when we talked about the algae and cyanobacteria and plankton. We talked about things like epa this and that, epipelic, epiphytic, epa... Um, epilithic, uh, um, uh, ep ep epilignic, uh, whatever kinds of primary producers, but we'll talk about that. I'd like you to know the growth forms of aquatic macrophytes, and we've already, you've already discovered three because you've observed this yourself. I'd like you to learn the importance of aquatic macrophytes to lake ecology. We'll step through a bunch of those, and I'd like to convince you that um, aquatic macrophytes in littoral zones are very important and shouldn't be relegated to the um, sobriquet of weeds. Um, I'd like you to understand the, the factors that limit the depth distributions of macrophytes. And any of you who've been diving have ob observed this probably. As soon as you get below, oh, I don't know, an atmosphere or two, uh, you know, 10, 10 meters or, sorry, uh, yeah, 10 meters or so, you don't find too many aquatic macrophytes. And I'd like you to understand why. I'd like you to learn about the seasonal succession in macrophyte communities. And of course, this um, assumes that you live in a place with season or that you, um, that you understand what seasons are like, but we'll try to review all that. And I'd like you to also understand the influences of eutrophication, um, artificial eutrophication on, um, on macrophyte um, ecology. And I think uh, putting all that together, you understand how um, bad eutrophication can be for the um, biodiversity, stability, and functioning of aquatic ecosystems. So those are my objectives, and um, it won't take as long as it seems. So literal primary producers. Um, now there are a couple of words for these big um, aquatic plants, and they are um, aquatic macrophytes or aquatic hydrophytes. Okay, was, well hydrophytes obviously means aquatic, so there are two kinds of major um, names. They, they we'll talk about the primary producers and production, and the types of macrophyte growth forms and and we've already talked about the evolution and biodiversity of them. So that we've already uh, covered in session 18. Now, first I'd like you to understand how productivity varies in the biosphere. And um, this is a, a, an ancient graph uh, from Odom's work in a book called The Fundamentals of Ecology, but it's still very valid today. And the bottom line on all this, and we'll step through it piece by piece, the bottom line is that littoral and estuarine production, 
estuaries being essentially the literal, sort of literal zones of marine ecosystems, are not um, uh, are extremely high. They're the highest in the biosphere, because water and light are not limiting, and soils are rich in carbon and nutrients. So basically, they are not limited. Production is not limited by water, not limited by light, not limited by carbon, and not limited by nutrients. So that is why, in a nutshell, why littoral zones are extremely productive. Littoral zone primary producers are macrophytes and the epiflora, which we've talked about to some degree already, and um, we'll come back to again. So um, here's and I will. I promise we walk through this. So I I will. But here we have the primary production, and this is in uh, thousands of kilocalories per square meter per year. And obviously, this is a gross simplification. But we'll give you some idea about where productivity is high. So going all the way to the deserts, I think you understand primary production is very low. What's the problem? The problem is essentially that there isn't any water. And you need water. And if you think about the equation for primary production, what do you put together in order to make sugars? It's water and carbon dioxide. Probably plenty of carbon dioxide out there. But there probably isn't any water to speak of, and that's why deserts have very low primary production. Less than half, um, half of a thousand kilocalories. We call that a million, uh, less than half a million uh, calories per square meter per year. So pretty low uh, production. Now if you go to its counterpoint uh, over here on the other end, the deep blue sea, um, again, primary production is pretty low. And... There's plenty of water out there, right? But the big problem out in the deep oceans is, well, it could be a couple of them, is that way deep in the ocean, of course, light is extinct. Uh, there is not very much light. Um, but also, nutrients are extremely poor. So there's just not much in the way of nutrient to grow plants with. So it's not, um, probably not water limited anymore because the seas are just made up of water. But it's probably more or less nutrient limited and that's why it is essentially an aquatic desert in terms of primary production. Now we can sort of move in, uh, sort of a sandwich in on the high primary production areas. The things like grasslands, deep forests, mountain forests, and agri some agricultural systems, even enhanced agriculture, is ranging from about half a million calories per square meter per year to about three million calories per square meter per year in primary production. Likewise, if we go over to the continental shelf waters with greater nutrient input and obviously uh, uh, probably a better light environment overall and certainly a little bit more nutrient coming in from the continents, then we see primary production from about a million, half a million calories per square meter a year to about three. And um, oh, we've been there already, I guess. Um, and then if we look at moist forests and secondary communities, shallow lakes, moist grasslands, and most agriculture, we're, um, we're running about 3 million to 10 million kilocalories per square meter per year. Agriculture is supposed to be pretty productive. And actually, agricultural producers have increased um, agricultural production substantially, even since this time. But it still doesn't rival those of some of the areas of the world where the highest production exists. Now, where is that? Uh, where are those areas that have 10 million to 25 million kilocalories per square meter per year in primary production? Estuaries, springs, coral reefs, uh, terrestrial communi communities on alluvial plains. Okay, so you're alleviating things like carbon and water limitation there. Energy subsidized agriculture, and certainly the littoral zones of lakes. So anything that is unlimited or relatively unlimited by any kinds of factors has very high primary production and that is a very high rate indeed. So littoral zones and estuaries have amongst the highest primary production uh, clocked anywhere on the planet because water and light are not limiting and there is abundant carbon dioxide and nutrients. Here's just an example from an ancient paper from 1950s of, uh, um, on productivity in various kinds of plants. And um, again, corn production has probably increased uh, quite a bit since then. But the, the idea here is, here we have corn or maize production at, uh, and, uh, at uh, uh, some units of about two 
and about double that in cattail production. Cattail production is extremely high, and um, and things like prairies and hay fields and rice paddies and so on, not nearly as high as some of these wetland plants. So wetland plants and littoral zone plants are extremely productive. Now, who are those littoral zone primary producers? And let's just skim through these. And we have talked about the algae quite a bit in previous sessions, so we won't tarry too long with those. But in the littoral zone, we have emergent, floating-leaved, and submersed uh, macrophytes, or hydrophytes, tracheophytes, three different names for the same thing. And you can find those in, um, on here we have the submersed macrophytes, floating leaved macrophytes and the emergent macrophytes shown on this diagram. There are other kinds of organisms that live and these are the epi sorts of organisms. They are epiphytic, that is algae material that looks a bit like this, sort of a bunch of different kinds of organisms growing on surfaces. We have epilithic, as the surface of plants that is, we have epilithic um, uh, primary producers, uh, uh, epilithic algae usually growing on rocks. We have epipelic primary producers growing on mud, epipelic over here, and ep episamic, episamic pr primary producers growing on sand. Um, there are other kinds of uh, sort of phytoplankton that grow amongst aquatic plants. And sometimes we call that the littoral plankton or the metaplankton um, that grows between and among the stems of aquatic macrophytes. So epiphyton grows on plants, epilithon on rocks, epipelon on mud, um, and these of course would be s similar to the, you know, the area of the haptobenthos and the episamon that lives on sand. So let's talk about the various um, growth and life forms. There are emergent um, plants. There are rooted plants with floating leaves. There are non-rooted plants with floating leaves. There are rooted plants with submersed leaves and non-rooted plants with submersed leaves. A very uh, big variety of these plants. And thinking back to the last session, you can probably think of what some of these are. Uh, things like the the emergence would be like cattails and bulrushes and uh, some grasses and sedges. The rooted floating leaf plants would be like the um, water lilies would be a good example. Um, and non-rooted floating leaf plants would be things like duckweed. Um, um, and well, we've seen some of them in the last session, of course, the um, various macrophytes that float around the surface. Rooted submersed plants would be like the pond weeds, uh, potamogeton, and so on. And non-rooted submersed plants, um, there are several. There are some that uh, ha have holdfasts only, no real roots, and those would be things like Cara and Nutella, the algae, the macrophytic algae. They'd also be uh, things like Ceratophyllum or Coontail that um, is uh, really not rooted, um, although it it can can root. It seems to grow almost as a non-rooted form. Uh, so there are examples of each. So here are those aquatic macrophytes. Again, we have emergence. We've seen this in session 18 before. Here we have lemna, duckweed, uh, floating at the surface. Here we have nufar, a surface, uh, uh, a floating leaf plant. We have an example of typha, which is an emergent plant. There also are the various rushes, as I mentioned before. And then we have a lot of submersed plants, a great biodiversity of these submersed plants. Had lots more pictures of these. Some of the famous names uh, might be things like Elodea, um, that one, and Myrifilum or um, Milfoil is another one. Valisneri or Corkscrew, or uh, I think they call this Duck Celery or something. Some of the Potamogetons or Pondweeds. Uh, anything with a P on it is a Pondweed. Richardsonii and Amplifolius, kind of large leaf plants that look very much like terrestrial plants but are f are completely submersed in some cases of course they may have um uh, uh, uh they their inflorescences may be above the surface they may be emergent now let's look at the zonation of various species and it, it varies among lakes and if we uh, if we go to a sort of a clear water lake and this is an example from new zealand First off, we'll have a wave wash zone in this area here where uh, plants simply can't 
um, plant stay rooted. Um, there will be a shallow water community in sort of the upper littoral zone. Um, another shallow, uh, and, uh, and there'll be, in, in New Zealand, it'll be a Lagaro Sifan uh, zone in here, an Elodia zone down here, and then finally a meadow of Kara or an alga that it doesn't have, um, it doesn't actually have um, uh, vascular tissue. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit when we talk about the uh, limitations on them. If, now, if we look at a, a sort of a brown water Nordic lake, we may find grasses and sedges. We may then find elodeids in sort of this area, sparganium. And then, um, because the isoedids are, are very good, or quillworts are very good with um, low light levels and um, and low pH, they'll uh, function down. They're, you know, they'll they'll be able to uh, live basically down until there's no more light or somewhere below the compensation depth. So submergent biodiversity uh, varies with a variety of factors. And this uh, <coughs> graph illustrates how lake area and pH have an effect. And in the previous um, slide, you could see that um, there seem to be fewer species or less abundance of different kinds of things in that lake that had brown water. And those tend to be low pH uh, ecosystems. Here we have lake area. And as lake area increases, mind you, it's a, a fairly fuzzy plot, right? But as lake area increases, the number of species uh, rises fairly rapidly. Now, this is a logarithmic graph. So this is 10, 20, 30, 40. You may have up to 40 species in some of these higher pH lakes that are very large. Um, one of the lakes I study has 22 species of aquatic plants in it. It's a rather relatively large lake, and it has a very high, well, a moderate and stable pH level. Low pH would be more bog-like lakes, and pH has a ma major physiological effects, of course, on plants. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times um, that macrophytes don't um, descend into the water to extreme depths. And that's pretty straightforward because vascular macrophytes, uh, other than the bryophytes, are, are uh, well, vascular macrophytes are basically limited to about one atmosphere, above one atmosphere in pressure, simply because they have difficulty translocating gases to roots at high pressure. So anytime you're approaching about an atmosphere or about 10 meters or about 30 feet of depth, you should see the um, vascular plants and sort of um, angiosperms uh, disappear. Um, and other kinds of plants can uh, grow somewhat deeper because they don't have vascular tissue. Now let's look at this graph. This is from Patricia Chambers' work and Jakob Kalf. And here we have the uh, depth of colonization, and this was taken from a variety of different lakes. And um, you can see that as the Secchi transparency in this, uh, when you should know what Secchi disk transparency is from the session on light, um, as the Secchi disk transparency gets great, um, the, um, the, uh, the uh, depth uh, distribution is possible, but if the Secchi disk trans, uh, uh, obviously the, the uh, plants can't go any deeper than they can get light, so they can't be very deep in lakes with low Secchi disk transparency. But in any case, the angiosperms, regardless of a great deal of water clarity, don't really make it past oh, I don't know, even about eight meters um, very often in depth. So um, down at about 30 feet or uh, 10 meters, you should see very few angiosperms. Now, there are kinds of macrophytes that can exist on lower light levels, and that would be the caraphytes, for example, and they don't have vascular tissue, and so you may find those uh, down to 20 meters uh, or even 30 meters in depth. And I've actually seen them at about... Um, big bushes of caraphytes um, constant all year round down to depths of about, um, yeah, I guess about 20 meters um, in a very clear lake that I have frequented, I've, I've been diving in quite frequently. Now the bryophytes can go even deeper and, uh, uh, and uh, th they aren't quite as 
uh, they don't go down quite as deeply in lo under low light conditions, but where secudisc transparency is quite high, up to 20 meters or so, which is a great deal of clarity, um, 60 feet um, for those of you on the imperial system. Um, uh, 60 feet of water clarity is pretty good for an inland water, um, and um, but they can uh, exist down to let's say about 40 meters, which is um, uh, even uh, deeper, uh, th in deeper than the secutist transparency. Um, and what that means is they must be very efficient at dealing with very low light levels, some of the bryophytes or mosses. So depth distribution is limited by light penetration. Over here is an experimental study of pressure and atmosphere, and this is growth rates. And um, you can see it shows the same thing. Um, this is uh, hippurus. Um, and when the pressure got better than half um, an atmosphere, gases could no longer be translocated, and that particular species was unable to grow. So the maximum depth of colonization varies, of course, with water clarity, as we saw in the last graph. Um, and um, the fields, uh, and it also will vary among regions. And water clarity uh, sort of interacts with uh, different, um, uh, with color and so on. Uh, so uh, in, in this this particular plot shows the dark symbols are from New York and Vermont, and the open symbols are oligotrophic Wisconsin lakes. Here we have the secchi disk transparency. Here is the maximum depth of colonization, and um, and the uh, for a given secchi disk transparency, lakes in New York and Vermont seem to be able to colonize more deeply um, than are those in um, uh, those in oligotrophic Wisconsin lakes, and this may be a function of um, this may be a function of nutrient concentrations or other factors. Macrophyte biodiversity also varies with de depth, and that should make a, that should be very clear to you already, just intuiting from what you've already learned that if the vascular plants fall out at great depth, say uh, deeper than 10 meters, you can't have very many species down there because you're going to be relegated essentially to the bryophytes and caryophytes. So this graph is a little bit upside down. This is depth over here. This is number of species. So when we're at great depth, we have very few species, just a couple of them, one or two species that can make it. Um, and this is from Lake George, New York. And then as you, um, as you go to lower and lower depth, the number of species climbs. And this is one of those very specious lakes that overall has about uh, something like 40, uh, 38 or 40 species of aquatic plants in it much more uh, biodiversity in the shallower waters of Lake George and shallower waters of a great deal of other uh, uh, other lakes too, many other lakes too. Macrophytes are abundant under nutrient-rich, warm, shallow, clear water conditions and this is actually from my master's uh, research. You can see me hauling up a big rakeful of aquatic plants, mostly muriophyllum and ceratophyllum, off the bottom of a lake in northern North Dakota in the United States, and we're collecting these things and weighing them. What you're seeing here is a wet mass that weighs probably about half a kilo um, of um, mass per square meter, something like that, maybe a kilo. The the rake that I was using was, um, I think, about half of a square meter. So this is a very nutrient-rich, warm, shallow, clear water system, and the macrophytes grow in pr proliferation. In this lake, enough to take the lower unit basically off of of an outboard motor when they'd rise up to the surface due to gas um, gas bubbles on them. So they can be quite amazing in biomass. Here's a beautiful uh, literal zone view from a from a plane just to give you a sense for the, um, the the sort of the landscape that you see in literal zones in lakes that have relatively clear water. Phenomenal variability in the types of things. It's a very intricate uh, ecosystem with a lot of interstices and sort of microhabitats within it, so a very complex environment. Now, there are a lot of reasons that aquatic macrophytes are very important, and um, I'd like you to understand that. It's very important that you do so if you really want to understand the functioning of aquatic ecosystems. And here they are. I'll read them off, and then we'll go through and we'll illustrate each one of them as we go along because it's very important. Macrophytes create a, a phenomenal amount of organic production that fuels the detrital food web. Very important for the benthos and for organisms living in the littoral zone. They are the substrate for periphyton and epifauna, and this provides important fish food. 
that's actually indispensable to fish and in many life stages um, produces um, a very high quality food that's essential to their um, to their growth and and health. Aquatic macrophytes uh, provide food for waterfall fowl. They provide food for some invertebrates directly, and we can talk about. I'll show you some pictures, and we'll talk about that. They're also shelter and important nursery grounds for fish growth. And I can't show you all the videos that I have taken of this. There's some pretty impressive things. In fact, I can't put my hands on them, but I'll show you a little bit about it. They provide a very intricate uh, zones and places for little fish to hide and for larger fish to forage. Um, they're uptake sites for nutrients and other pollutants and are used directly for that by engineering studies. And they also do some nutrient pumping or transport of nutrient up out of the sediments, and they do this on short-term and seasonal basis. And um, they also increase water clarity through nutrient uptake, allelopathy, and uh, dead, uh, dead space settling. So lots of different mechanisms for keeping waters clear. So if you have aquatic macrophytes, even though you may have a lot of nutrients, uh, the water may, in fact, be relatively clear. And as I mentioned above uh, just a, uh, a little bit, of, a bit ago, they're great nutrient retention sites. So let's look at each one of those briefly. Now, here is um, I, I, one of the first things I said there was that literal organic production is very high compared to other systems. And this is an old study by um, actually uh, including Robert Wetzel, a very famous limnologist and uh, uh, Rich and other collaborators it was published back in the 1970s. This is one of many examples. Here you can see the darker hatched area is actually the littoral zone of Lawrence Lake in Michigan. And over here at the right you see the annual benthic carbon budget for Lawrence Lake and the sources of that carbon that goes into the detrital food chain. Now I think, I hope what you can see from this, if you can read the numbers, is that we have a, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 90 grams per, of carbon per square meter per year added from the aquatic plants. The epiphytes, that's the uh, al algal material that grows on the plants, adds another 40 grams of carbon per square meter per year. Um, the sedimentation of the, um, of the uh, phytoplankton only accounts for about 10 grams uh, of carbon per square meter, meter per year. So if you take epiphytes and um, epiphytes and, and the aquatic plants together, it gives us about 130 grams compared to about 10. So the um, a littoral zone of this lake produced about 10 times more carbon deposition in 10 times more carbon de deposition in the uh, from the littoral zone than it did from um, did did from the algal production in the open water. It's in very big contrast, I think, to how much the limnologists actually study these systems. So they're harder to study, admittedly, um, but they're extremely important to the energetic function of these systems and, and likely also to carbon budgets and global carbon cycle and global climate change. Now, I'd like to get a look at the seasonality of production and think about how this works, too. Um, and this is an important part of production, of course. And you know, in the previous graph, we were basically looking at overall sort of net inputs of carbon. And here we're going to look at a couple of things, just the basic metabolism really of aquatic plants throughout the summer. So what we see here is a, a schematic. This is again from Bob Wetzel's early work uh, the, of the development of, of uh, uh, biomass. This is overall biomass growth of aquatic macrophytes. Down here you see gross production, uh, you see respiration, and then um, net production, that is to say the increment, additional amount of um, new biomass added per unit time would be the net production. That's the difference between the gross production, that's the amount of photosynthesis, less the amount used for respiration. So I hope what you can see here is where the difference between gross production and respiration is greatest, that's where you have the highest net production. That net production is added to the biomass. That's what increases the biomass. And as long as we have increasing net production, um, as long as we have positive net production, biomass will increase because we're adding more biomass to it. But as soon as net production becomes negative, this is death down here, where um, gross production is actually less than respiration, then the biomass begins to decline.
And um, so this is a basic seasonal cycle. Somewhere toward the end of summer, you'll begin seeing the maximum biomasses. And as soon as the biomasses begin to decline, you know that the gross productivity um, is uh, inferior to the respiration rate. And net productivity is negative, And there's overall mortality. Uh, macrophytes beds can also uh, remain all winter and stay functional, and I've seen some of these. And I just wanted to show, see you a little, see a little bit of video of what macrophyte beds can look like in the temperate zone. This is Big Car Lake near Minocqua, Wisconsin. So I'm guessing that's about 46 and a half, 46 degrees north latitude, something like that, maybe. And in this video, what you're going to see is somebody lowering a, ca a camera down into water that's a meter and a half deep under 25 centimeters of snow and 20, 20 centimeters of ice. You'll see the camera descend through the ice, but then you'll begin to see the bottom. And I think you'll be impressed with how much light is actually uh, coming through the ice uh, at that point. Now, you know, 20 centimeters of ice isn't very much. Sometimes in the places I worked in Canada, we had a meter and a half of ice. Um, normally, it, um, in, in about 47 degrees, North in um, in uh, North America will get about a meter of ice, something like that. So this is, but this is in January, um, and uh, let's just have, let's try and have a, have a look at this. So we're going down just about a meter and a half, not very deep. I think you're seeing some quill wart there. I'm not really sure. It's a little hard to see. Old dead leaves, probably some Valisneria. Very, very healthy plant material down there. And uh, I think they've got a light on the camera, but still, uh, it's obviously getting enough light to stay green. It's not dying. So what that means is if it's, if it's uh, green and not frozen, then it basically means that, you, that uh, photosynthesis is at least keeping up with... Um, uh, with respiration. I'm going to do this next winter in a bunch of lakes and uh, hopefully add some more video like this. I think this is quite fascinating. Ice diving is really exciting to do. There's a big, looks like a big old oak leaf. There's really a lot of aquatic macrophyte vegetation under there. In some places, the uh, in winter time, um, it dies out except in a few places, uh, and then um, you get little clumps then that spread out to uh, add. I think there's some uh, graminaid sort of potamogeton, um, uh, pondweed. It's really kind of hard to tell at this resolution what's there. I think the isoetids are kind of, kind of diagnostic, sort of knocked over. And here we go, back out again. So quite a lot of macrophytic vegetation, even in the winter time. Um, it's obviously cold. It's going to be approaching, um, you know, approaching one or about one or two degrees, maybe even a little bit lower than that. Um, <clears throat> but the light levels um, and uh, light levels uh, hang in there and allow the things to uh, continue to function. Then, of course, when ice, uh, ice cover is lost, it can basically explode again and begin to grow early in the spring. Now, over um, the range of uh, eutrophication, of course, increasing fertility, the different kinds of macrophytes tend to wax and wane. And you may have observed this yourself, that in lakes where you have a lot of algae that are very green, you may not have much in the way of submersed um, vegetation. You may have emergence. There may be um, a lot of phytoplankton and not very much in the way of submersed macrophytes. And you may not even have very much attached or uh, literal algae. Uh, Bob Wetzel put forward the sort of general scheme for this. Here's the increasing fertility uh, of this of uh, aquatic ecosystems, and uh, you can think of these as clear water um, lakes over here that are nutrient limited, oligotrophic systems. Maybe moving to into the mesotrophic systems here, eutrophic systems here with very low light level, and then eventually hyper eutrophic ecosystems over here. Um, in general, the um, overall idea for the submersed macrophytes is they will begin to grow as nutrients increase, and they'll grow to greater uh, primary productivity. 
But then light limitation due to increased phytoplankton becomes a problem and their abundance will then decline to very, very low levels, almost zero essentially in, ver in eutrophic and hypereutrophic lakes. Um, along with that increase in submersed macrophytes, you see an increase in attached algae. But again, they're going to be sort of decimated by light limitation up till the point that they can grow on the surfaces of emergent macrophytes as they begin to take over. Clearly, this is the trace of phytoplankton. Phytoplankton will begin to decline even in uh, hypereutrophic uh, systems because of light uh, self-shading and light limitation that we've discussed in previous previous sessions. And then <clears throat> um, the emergent macrophytes also sort of <clears throat> follow along and um, I don't entirely agree with this uh, part, this particular line, and I'll modify my opinion here on this in, uh, uh, on this in just a second. But uh, Wetzel suggests that emergent macrophytes go to higher and higher and higher productivity as um, fertility is increased. What I've, I've observed in some very product productive systems is, in fact, e even the emergent macrophytes tend to decline. And I'll, and I'll show you a couple of pictures a little later in this particular session about that. Um, th I think they can't maintain over the long term enough um, storage root structure to be able to then re-emerge in deep, uh, deepish water and they become more and more restricted to the very periphery of a lake ecosystem under, under increasing fertility. Another reason that littoral zones are really important is that they're a super important uh, source of food for fish, and uh, this is the substrate. This sub they uh, form the substrate. The macrophytes do form the substrate for periphyton, epiphyton, that feeds a rich and productive epifauna, very diverse, um, ep um, sort of ben uh, benthic, uh, benthic pelagic mix of organisms. M many Clodocera, for example, that look just like Daphnia, that are attached to plants variety of copepods and all the things you'd find in the plankton as well as all the things that you'd find in the um, in the benthos so um, this tends to be amongst the most biodiverse areas with extremely high surface area because of the macrophytes and therefore extremely high productivity of very nutrient rich food also the littoral zone and the macrophytes are a very important source of detritus that feeds abundant and, and biodiverse littoral benthos on the bottom of this system so that uh, we have lots of animals and plants here lots of animals and plants here not surprising then that the uh, the pond ladies uh, illustration shows where fish are they tend to be within the littoral zone and um, these littoral zones are super places for larval fish to grow and also uh, for um, adults to grow and function and reproduce they're probably the most important in most lakes there are lakes where the pelagic system uh, is very important because there really isn't much littoral zone and these tend to be very large lakes with very steep sides. Another reason that uh, littoral zones and macrophytes are important is that the littoral zone provides waterfowl food and uh, this um, uh, is a graph from the CALF text that I hope that you are all enjoying um, showing the shore index and we've seen this before when we talked about lake morphometry this is a shore, shore index. This is kilometer of shore per square kilometer of water area. So it gives a sense of how much littoral zone area, how much meandering there is to the shore. And you can see here that the waterfowl biomass tends to increase pretty steeply with increasing um, a littoral zone availability. This is because they feed off invertebrates in the littoral zone, same as the fish do, and also the aquatic plants form uh, food, uh, nutrient-rich food uh, sources for many uh, different kinds of waterfowl. Some other animals uh, will take eat uh, macrophytes directly, and the two most famous ones are probably crayfish and the grass carp. Although there are others who will, um, many of them smaller than that. But uh, crayfish will eat a variety of detrital material, but also will attack aquatic macrophytes directly. Uh, grass carp is. Um, uh, is being in introduced, triploid grass carp, hopefully they can't reproduce, are being introduced all over the place to control aquatic plants. The problem with grass carp, however, is that they eat a lot of vegetation, but they excrete their nutrients into the water column, uh, causing algal blooms. I'd rather have clear waters and macrophytes myself, 
uh, than I would algal blooms that are very difficult uh, to manage, although we know how to manage those too. Another reason that um, uh, aquatic um, macrophytes and littoral zones are really important is that they're terrific shelter and nursery grounds for fish. And um, these are not fish, obviously. This, I, I um, borrowed this uh, video off of YouTube, and this is um, a guy snorkeling in uh, a small um, spring-fed lake in uh, in Florida, but with a lot of aquatic plants. And I think you'll see uh, a little about how these um, uh, these aquatic plants function as habitat and a shelter for these fish. The guy is obviously extremely brave to go into this frightening habitat. Actually, it's quite quite a beautiful. These um, springs in Florida are beautiful, clear water. Um, and there we've got probably Vallisneria, it looks like. Not really sure exactly. Oh, and there's some uh, various Potamogetans, but pretty soon you see just a huge ab abundance of fish. And um, I regret that I couldn't find my, uh, these are centrarchids of some kind, sunfishes, and um, I couldn't find my videos. I've got fantastic videos down and going through the various um, caverns within the aquatic plants, and uh, uh, but these are wonderful places for fish to live f and forage and grow. Obviously, we're done. Now, another thing that I mentioned earlier that macrophytes and littoral zones are good for is the uptake of nutrient and pollutant, uh, uptake of nutrients and pollutants. And I'm just showing um, uh, one graph for phosphorus here, but the same could be repeated for a variety of deals, a variety of different substances. Um, and this is a change in phosphorus in treatment ponds with and without aquatic macrophytes. And just to show you how important this is, uh, this is being harnessed by um, uh, engineers for um, um, for removing contaminants from wastewater. And this is actually, um, these graphs were in a, a journal called Energy and Environment Research. So um, having to, uh, to do with um, nutrient-rich uh, and metal-laden effluents from various uh, kinds of energy resources. But it's really clear. This is a concentration of nutrients in the water. And by the way, this is an unbelievable amount of phosphorus in that effluent. And um, this is the control. This is without macrophytes. This is with macrophytes. You can see that regardless of what species they put in there, these things took up the, the, um, took up the nutrients really, really rapidly. Uh, and now whether it is uh, the macrophytes doing it or the f uh, epifauna on the surfaces um, or removing the macrophytes is really unimportant to the conclusions here, but the, the, this um, macrophyte epifauna complex is really efficient at uh, nutrient uptake and taking up and removing contaminants from contaminated water. Also, aquatic macrophytes pump nutrients up out of the sediments. You're probably aware that sediments are quite rich in nutrients, and we used to think that they actually were pumping it up sort of actively during the growing season. Well, there's a little bit of that. It's not terribly important. It occurs basically due to cell lysis, or the breaking of plant cells and leaking of material out of plants, or also by, um, say, crayfish uh, or grass carp eating the plants and then excreting it into the water column. They aren't leaking really a, a terrific amount of it. Um, a friend of mine did quite a number of analyses on this with radioactively labeled sediment and to see how much of those nutrients could be moved out of the sediments, but it was a small, really a relatively small amount of nutrient. Um, now, the, the way they do pump nutrients into the back into the water column is as macrophytes senesce at the end of the season, they break down and release these nutrients into the water column. It's another way that they're important to the functioning of aquatic ecosystems. Macrophytes can alter uh, water clarity too, and they do this a bunch of ways. And uh, just first, I'll explain to you what you're seeing. And again, this is from the um, the CALF um, limnology text. Here's a total phosphorus concentration. So we have um, uh, lots of nutrients over here and not so many over here. Here we see the Secchi disk transparency here. And these are for two different kinds of um, uh, lakes. These are uh, the open, uh, open symbols are lakes with lots of macrophytes, and the uh, closed or darker symbols are those without very many macrophytes. 
And I hope that you can see that regardless of nutrient concentration, the water clarity is much, much higher, um, uh, the secu disc transparency much higher um, if, um, if there are macrophytes there than if they are not there. They clear the waters in a lot of different ways. Uh, one of them is nutrient removal, clearly, as was shown in the previous slide. Another way is they form dead baffle spaces between the leaves, and this um, allows um, particles to sediment out really quickly, um, and this sort of protects the particles from resuspension. And also they kind of root the um, root soil as one sees in one's yard also, and they'll hold the sediment down and keep the material down on the bottom. So lots of ways that macrophytes can alter water clarity. And in fact, um, if you uh, intro, if you can find a way to increase macrophytes in a very eutrophic lake, you often can have relatively high water clarity um, and um, good recreational conditions, even though you may have excess phosphorus in the water column. It's part of the strategy that we use, can use in managing water quality. Now, here's the proof of the uh, emergent, uh, the uh, demise of emergence in eutrophic lakes that I promised you earlier. Um, this is um, this photograph was taken really a long time ago in in a lake that I have studied in the state of Iowa, and this was taken in Clear Lake, Iowa, by Bob Carlander back in 1958. He used to go around this state taking pictures systematically of the same sites in lakes over and over again each year. When I went back and studied the same lake in 2000, and I took the picture from the same place, this is what I saw. This is a very eutrophic lake. It was running about 180 parts per billion of total phosphorus, so uh, and about um, only maybe a f um, 20, 20 centimeters of water clarity on average. You can see that even the emergence have gone. This lake, if you look carefully at this photo, you can see dead spaces formed by probably by the flowering bodies of submersed macrophytes, some submersed macrophytes here in emergence, lots of emergence stretching all the way across this bay. And you can see the same point here and here, really no macro, uh, emergent macrophyte beds left. Macrophytes are basically eradicated during eutrophication. And we've tracked this in some lakes, and here's uh, some here are some changes in, with eutrophication in Clear Lake, Iowa, and this doesn't track the biomass of of uh, uh, macrophytes and, um, and littoral zones, but it does show the relative abundance of submergent floating leaved and emergent macrophytes as the lake went from, um, you know, relatively a low productivity and good water clarity to a period of very poor water clarity. The only macrophytes that were left were emergents, pretty much, um, and those were isolated in a very narrow littoral fringe. Uh, eutrophication is basically uh, the enemy of littoral zones and therefore the enemy of um, uh, biodiversity and ecosystem functioning of those uh, important littoral habitats. Fish can also influence macrophytes and this is from a carp removal experiment that I did some years ago and this is published in the journal Hydrobiologia if you're interested in it. Um, prior to, uh, to the experiment um, th both of these water bodies looked identical. They were both sort of brownish green color and not surprisingly in this agricultural region. We experimentally removed all the carp from the side. Um, uh, this is the Asian carp, uh, Cyprinus carpio, and these things are uh, very effective at uprooting vegetation and removing it, taking it out and um, and also rooting around in the benthos so they have a tendency to destroy littoral zones. And so uh, we, this is actually the, um, uh, this is a, uh, an aerial photo taken about two weeks after the carp were removed. And the water had already totally cleared out because they were no longer there. <coughs> this uh, over on the right hand side shows <coughs> macrophyte coverage density of macrophytes after the carp removal. And this was, um, uh, uh, I think, about a month or month and a half after carp removal something like that. There were no macrophytes essentially in this part of the lake before uh, carp removal and they were filling in very rapidly afterward. So fish can influence macrophytes too and are also part of uh, the toolkit that we use in um, uh, lake restoration management. So here's a summary of what I've tried to, um, tried to uh, tell you today uh, 
about um, macrophyte and littoral zone ecology. Littoral zone production is high because plants can get ample light, water, nutrients, and carbon. And I've left carbon off of the summary slide. Carbon is very important too. Littoral zones contain all kinds of different organisms, but the epiflora and macrophytic vegetation provide substantial carbon fixation and primary production to this very active area. Macrophytes can be of three major types, emergent, submergent, and floating leaved, a and within those types, of course, we have some that are rooted and some that are not rooted. Macrophytes are essential features of healthy habitats, and they offer a, a huge variety of ecosystem services that we've reviewed, such as nutrient and pollutant sequestration, food sources for fish and wildlife, um, uh, water clearing um, abilities, uh, just a, a huge variety of different um, uh, different services offered by macrophytes and littoral zones, and so one should not think of them as weeds, but as essential uh, essential um, characteristics of healthy aquatic ecosystems. The depth distribution of macrophytes is limited by light and by pressure, and pressure uh, really only um, has a limiting effect on the vascular macrophytes, but light in general will limit all macrophyte distributions because they need to be able to make an energetic profit or they simply can't sustain their populations. Their seasonal, uh, seasonal development is driven by germination, of course, and then um, increases due to temperature and light availability, followed by self-shading, and then eventually die back as respiration begins to exceed gross uh, primary production, and net primary production becomes negative. And then finally, the last thing we talked about is uh, eutrophication. And we've discussed a lot of uh, really positive aspects of littoral zones. And I'd just like to underscore that one of the negative effects of eutrophication driven by things like excess nutrient addition to aquatic systems is uh, uh, just a, the decimation of really healthy littoral habitat that offers us uh, a substantial amount of irreplaceable ecosystem service.